Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you today. Good to see those of you that are in Columbus, those that are online today. Glad you're here this morning. Man, I love that song, The Reckless Love of God. It's talking about the pursuit of God, that God pursues us. Aren't you glad that God didn't give up on you, didn't give up on your neighbor, didn't give up on this world? He finished what he started. God is a God that finishes. Amen. God doesn't just start something. He finishes something. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about as we're wrapping up our series called Grow. God wants to finish what he started in you. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Today we're going to talk about finishing. God wants to finish what he started in you so he can begin something in someone else and finish in them what he started in you. Today we're talking about growing his church. And did you know the way that God grows his church, the way that he builds his kingdom is through people. It's through you and it's through me. In fact, if you were to think about in your life how you came to know Christ, whether it was your mom or your dad or a coach or a teacher or a friend or somebody you went to school with, all of us could point to someone who helped bring us to Jesus. That's how God builds his kingdom is through his people. And the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about different ways that we grow. We've said that we all grow in some ways. The questions are, are, the question is, are we growing in the right way, growing the way Jesus wants us to? We kicked off this series talking about we're called to grow in Christ's likeness. Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of Christ. We're called to grow in who he is. And then as we grow in him, we realize that we got gifts. And last week we talked about that we're, to, we're called to grow in his gifts. And as we grow in his likeness and we grow in his gifts, we begin to realize that it's not about us and we're called to grow his church. And when we think of growing a church, we think of, okay, this is a message about trying to get people to come to a building. And the reality is the church is not a building. The church is a a people of God. And God's desire is for us to grow his people, not simply because we all come here on a Sunday morning, but we're called to go and make disciples. That's how we grow his church. So how do we know if we're winning as a parent? It's not whether or not our child shows up on Sunday morning at church, although that's a wonderful thing that helps our faith. It's do they read his word? Are they concerned about their classmates coming to know Christ? As a believer in Christ, we're not just called to attend a service. We attend, whether virtually or physically, every week to encourage each other. That's important. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling together of people. But the reality is there's much more than that. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a Super Bowl going on today at 530. And I know it's hard to believe, but I'm a Chiefs fan. And one of the things that our team is known for is usually, not always, But we typically start fast. In fact, the team that we're playing today, Tampa Bay, earlier this year, we jumped out on them 17 to nothing. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be a blowout. This is going to be awesome. And the score at the end of the game ended up being 27 to 24. And part of the reason that ended up being that close is we didn't finish completely how we started We understand the concept of finishing what we start. And when we come to Jesus, it's no different. He doesn't want us to just start a relationship with him. He wants us to carry it on to completion. And a part of that completing is growing his church, growing his people. Now, Jesus, right before he ascended into heaven, he died, he resurrected to life. And then for a period of 40 days, he... um, He appeared to the disciples and he began to explain to them all about what it meant to follow him. And right before he leaves, some of us have been, you know, by a deathbed where somebody was passing away. My wife explains that when her grandma passed away, she was holding her hand and they had these exchanges of words. Some of you have been on a deathbed next to somebody who's, who's dying. And in those moments, you really don't say trivial things that aren't important. You know, if it's your last words that you're going to say, you're going to make them meaningful. Well, we know that Jesus didn't die when he ascended into heaven, but he knew that he was leaving them and he was going to be sending them the Holy Spirit. So he said some really important things. And what he said to them was that you need to go and make disciples. It's not enough that you saw what my miracles, you know, and you saw that I'm, a, that I'm the Lord and, and you know these things now. You know that I raised a life. It's more than that. There's a mission for you. It started when I pulled you guys off the boat and said, come and follow me. 
the process was taking place when you watched me heal and, and talk about the kingdom of God, but there's still more chapters to be written. And can I tell you today, as a church, as long as someone doesn't know Jesus, we have a mission to go and preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. So here's what happens, okay? Scripture tells us that the early church is, is uh, the group of people that um, came to know Christ in the early days and the disciples and a group of people that began to proclaim that Jesus is real. This is not just a guy that did signs and wonders. He really is the Messiah. But before they could go out and begin to proclaim the message of Jesus, Scripture says that they had to wait on the Holy Spirit. And as they waited on the Holy Spirit, they were all together and the Holy Spirit filled them all up and they began to go out and they began to preach. And there was a guy named Peter, and Peter, who had kind of been, he, Peter's like a lot of us, his heart's in the right place, but at times had made mistakes and denied Jesus and cut this dude's ear off, and Jesus said, no, don't lose your temper here, and he had put his you know, ear back together. Peter was one of those guys whose heart was in the right place, but sometimes, you know, he could be impulsive. But Peter was wanting the Lord to finish in him what he started. Have you ever seen somebody who had lots of potential, but maybe it wasn't completely realized yet? I've shared with you before, I coach baseball in the summer, and you'll see these kids who they don't have a lot of experience because no one's worked with them, but you can tell inside of them if they had someone working with them, they could be really good, you know? God saw in Peter these spiritual gifts, but he began to kind of shape him and mold him. And now all of a sudden, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, not just his, himself. He has the Holy Spirit inside of him. And he begins to preach, man. He begins to preach and share, hey, you need to turn your life over to Jesus. He saved my soul. And, and the disciples were praying. Everybody's together. They're all on the same page. And people start to get saved. And the church starts to grow. And I thought as we think about growing as church today, there's no other better example that, that we can think of today than what was the recipe of the early church? How did they grow? So here's what it says. Here was the culture that, that took place in those early days when Peter and, and the disciples and other believers were reaching people for Christ. Here's what it said. All the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, meaning each other, right, coming together, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. We're actually going to take the Lord's Supper here later today. If you're online at home, we encourage you to grab, grab crackers or juice at the end of this message. We're going to do... Uh, the Lord's Supper together. And also to what, church? To what? That sounded really exciting there. To what? Prayer. To prayer. Yeah, they devoted themselves to talking to God on behalf of themselves and more importantly, other people. And, and what happens is a deep sense of awe comes over them all. And the, the apostles performed many, many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared what? Everything they had. Yeah, several years ago, we remember, I think it was 2011 when the tornado hit Joplin. And churches and businesses and communities and people in general all came over to Joplin and began to help rebuild. And our church, along with a lot of other churches, went over there and were a part of that. Man, you saw people saying, hey, do you need my truck? He's like, dude, I don't know you. He's like, it's all right. Do you need my truck to go help find someone? Hey, do you need my bulldozer? It was one of the most crazy, amazing things you'd ever seen. People coming together, understanding what the purpose was. And man, when the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to work in someone's life, it's contagious. They sold their property and their possessions, and they shared money with who? With those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared meals with great joy and generosity. It probably wasn't very hard when someone invited someone, hey, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to have a gathering where we're going to worship the Lord, or we're going to get together and break bread. Would you like to come? I bet it wasn't very hard to get people to come. Not because they understood God's word, not because they knew everybody intimately, but they could see the Spirit of God at work. Amen? That's amazing. All the while this is going on, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. I've shared before, when I was growing up in this church, this church, we used to sing the song, I'm so glad I'm a part 
of the family of God. It was kind of like, why are we singing this song? But now as I've gotten older and understand the theology behind it, it's simply saying, I'm so glad I'm part of a family of believers who makes a difference in the lives of other people. So the question I asked earlier, how did the early church grow? What patterns were present? Now here's a question. Some of you are thinking, why does this message matter to me? What do I care? Well, the reality is today, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you need to know that Jesus wants to finish what he started in you and that his role for you is not just to avoid hell, right? Some of us say, well, there's no hell. Well, then why did Jesus die if there wasn't a hell? Why do we call him Savior? He had to save us from something, right? And we have to understand today that the reason that this message matters to you, to, to, should matter to us if we're believers, is you work with people. Maybe you live with people. And we all know people who don't know Jesus. And what we also have to remember is the work is not done when we bring a person to church. The work is not done if someone goes to teen camp and and lays it all on the altar and says, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. Well, that's awesome. But the Bible says there's more. We're called to go and not just get him to camp or get him to church. We're called to go and make a disciple. How do you get your child to say thank you every time someone does something for, for them? Is that because you tell them once? How do you, how do you create... A, a, how, uh, parents or, or, or uncles or aunts or grandmas or grandpas or, or business people. How do you create a culture? You think of Chick-fil-A. If you go to Chick-fil-A, man, their culture is just like, can I get you something? Would you like some sauce? You know, it's just awesome. We, other businesses are like that as well. How does that culture happen? And the reality is it's consistency, isn't it? And folks, we're called to make disciples not just by telling them once or, or, or living our life in front of them once. We're called to live that out in front of them each day. So there's some patterns that we see in the early church that we can apply today that will help us to make disciples. And you know, the reality is you may make a disciple and they never come to this church. And you know what? That doesn't matter. It's more than church attendance. Amen. It's living your life out in such a way that they say, I want that. So here's the first thing we know. The early church, which means when I say the early church, kind of the first generation church. In fact, whether you know it or not, Adam's humble. But Adam actually wrote a book before he came to this church called Generation One. You can actually, I think you can probably find it online. It's a bestseller in New York, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a bestseller, but he did write a book called Generation One, and it's all about what we're talking today, talking about the early church. But the early church was that first generation of Christians, but even more than the early church, just Christian in general, the way that we build the church is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's read it. The early church was filled with... Does this say malice, sexual immorality, jealousy? No. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, something we forget sometimes, even as believers, is that to live the life that God wants us to live, we do not have to do it in our strength. Aren't you glad? You don't want to know the old Kyle. You don't want to know the impatient old Kyle. You don't want to know him. And some of you would say the same thing. We live the life that Christ calls us to live, not in our strength, but in his strength. And we demonstrate his spirits. When you are saved, some of us already know this, but maybe some of us don't today. Maybe some of you watching online don't know this. When you ask Jesus into your heart, you are given the fruits of the spirit that you are required to steward. Just like if someone gives you a house and requires you to steward it, right? Which steward is a, is a big fancy word for take care of. And if we, if we are reading his word and we're coming to church and we're, we're praying and we're talking with him, then those, those fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on, they grow in us. But if we're not feeding the spirit and we're feeding our sinful nature, then those fruits atrophy in us. They shrink. But here's what takes place. When we come to know Jesus and we're filled with the Spirit, it manifests, it manifests itself in unique ways. Sometimes it's, it's through a forgiving spirit. Sometimes it's through an inclusive spirit. Sometimes it's in all these different ways. Well, it's kind of a bizarre thing 
to, to read about. But when initially, when the disciples and those around became filled with the Holy Spirit, they began, began to be able to speak languages that they couldn't speak. How many of you guys can speak two languages? Right? Some of you? Yes. Maybe three, four. The only Spanish I know is Yo Quiero Taco Bell. And I know that from a, from a commercial. In fact, in fact, we have an Hispanic ministry, and sometimes they'll speak Spanish, and I'll go, Yo Quiero Taco Bell. And they'll look at me like, you want Taco Bell? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> so here's what happens in this story. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking in other languages because of the Holy Spirit's ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from how many nations? Every nation living in Jerusalem. Can you imagine having the ability to speak all these different languages? When they heard the loud noise, they all come running. The Holy Spirit comes in. And they're bewildered because they hear all these people speaking in languages that they can't even speak normally. They're completely amazed. And they're saying, how can this be? They exclaim, these people are all from Galilee. And yet they're hearing, they he, we hear them speaking in, let's finish it, our own native languages. Now, this is just an example, but the reality is this morning, when we know Jesus and we are, we're kind, when someone else is not kind, when we're thoughtful and considerate and people are like, how can this be? You're not like my other girlfriend or my other boyfriend or my, or my husband or, or, my, or my wife or, or my employer. What is, what is different about you? How can this be? Here we are, and I'm not going to read it. I butchered it in the first service, so you can just see it up on the screen there. But here's a list of all the different languages of people from different world areas that had gathered together. Look at all those languages. And we hear, and we all hear these people speaking in their own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Let me just tell you today. Love communicates, amen? People know what, who Jesus is by the way that you love people. So they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. I think that's just kind of a weird thing to have in Scripture. They're, they're, they're just acting different. Yeah, they're, you know, they're drunk. They're sipping back on Grandpa's special sauce. No, it's the Holy Spirit. Right? And here's the reality. When you, when you know Jesus, people are like, what is wrong with him, man? He's talking nice. He's treating his wife nice. He's treating his, you know, his employee nice. He actually works hard at his job instead of waiting to get out of there. What's, what, is he drunk? No, they're not drunk. The Holy Spirit produces a peculiar, I, I grew, to the, grew up in this church where they always talked about peculiar and they said it was the way you dressed, you know, no makeup, no rings, long hair and, 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 and all this stuff and, and they, they kind of were misinterpreting the scripture. The reality is the peculiarity that, that, that the scripture is talking about is not in this external stuff. I mean, as we become a believer, there's things about us that might change. But really what it's talking about is a peculiar path, a peculiar way of loving people. I mean, it really, when you think about it, it's really peculiar for someone to do something that hurt you and you forgive them. I mean, because the natural thing to do is to say, you can go somewhere hot. So it'd be kind of peculiar to say, oh, man, I forgive you. I mean, it's kind of peculiar to give away your mower to your neighbor so because it is broke. I mean, the natural thing to do, right, from a self-perspective, I mean, what does a two-year-old do if you take a toy away from him? Mine. Or a 30, or wait, I'm 43. Or a 43-year-old guy, right? But the reality is this morning that what draws, wait, wait you're going to give me that? Or you're going to let me borrow that? Or you're going to, yeah, not because of me. I want to tell you what Jesus has done for me in my life. The early church, let's finish it was filled with the Holy Spirit. I would, I would go so far as to say, you don't even have to try at growing a church or a restaurant or a business or anything else. If the culture's healthy, if people are loving each other the right way, that's, that's something people want to be around. That's not only something people want 
to be around, that's something that people, hey, this is what I want for my life. So the early church was filled with the Spirit. And the early church was what? Unified in in purpose. Listen, I'm just going to tell you, I mentioned Chick-fil-A as an example again. All those kids and people that are working at Chick-fil-A, they're not nice just because they all hired these people who are just like that. I mean, they're probably a little bit that way, but it's because they all understand from leadership what the, what the bar is set at, what the culture's about. And Jesus is reminding the disciples, your job wasn't to watch me take water and make it wine. Your job wasn't to, to see me take some loaves and some fish and multiply them and say... Your job wasn't to, to just see me be nice to this guy who cut my ear off and heal him. Your job isn't just to grieve the fact that I died or to mysteriously wonder about the fact that my body was missing from the grave. Your job isn't over when you accept me into your life. Your job isn't just to get people to church. Your job isn't just to see someone get saved. Your job until you die. This is what he said right before he ascended into heaven is to go and make disciples. Disciples, that's what our filter is to be. So when we, what, what movies we watch, the, the, the spouses that we pick, the way that we talk to people, the way that we do business with people, the way that we handle our money, and on and on and on, every filter is about seeing people come to know Christ and grow in Christ. Why? Because that's how the church has grown. When you measure whether or not someone's sitting in a seat or not on a Sunday morning, that's not how you can measure whether a church is growing. Now, that could be a byproduct, right? But it's not the purpose. The purpose is to see disciples being made. The early church was unified in purpose. The quickest way to, to see the church atrophy is when people inside the church start making up their own purposes. I'm here to make sure that the music doesn't change. I'm here to make sure that, that everything stays the same. I'm here to make sure no one sits in my chair. If you were to ask the early church, hey, why are we here? Make disciples. Make disciples. Make disciples. Make sure no one takes my spot. No, 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 no. That, that's not what it's about. Churches can become places where it's the popular thing to do or it's just the place where we come together kind of like a club. That's not what Jesus had, had planned for them. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're a coach, you want your team to finish. You don't just start well, you finish. And in the kingdom of God, even to a greater degree, Jesus says, finish. The other thing that's kind of a side note here is that sometimes we want to create many us's. Is that a word? Many us is? Many people like us. I have three kids who are beautiful, amazing people, and the, all three of them are different. I have one of them that's a little bit more like me than the other two, but the reality is this morning, if I try to make them all like me or Wit tries to make them all like her, then we're not letting... God make who they are. Does that make sense? You have people that you're going to serve with that maybe doesn't do it the way you do it. In fact, you may have a son or a daughter at home that may not understand it the way you understand it. See, we're not called to uniformity, but we are called to unity. Amen? Let's read it. Unity doesn't require Unity doesn't require uniformity. We don't all have to. In fact, Scripture talks about that. It says we're the body of, the, of Christ. You've got these Enneagram tests and, and, and disc tests and, and, and spiritual gifts. You have all these things. But really what it comes down to, what it's getting across is some of us are the elbows. Some of us are the knees. Some of, it, of, of us are the shoulders. But one person is the head. And that's Jesus. And so we're called to appreciate each person's part in the body of Christ and to join together in understanding that we're called to, 
to you unite together for the purpose of reaching others. Here's the last thing, okay? Now let's just be honest. Some of you don't mind sharing. Some of you hate to share. Some of you don't like sharing, okay? So I'm not gonna pick on those who don't like to share. How many of you like to share? Be honest, all right? Come on, be honest. How many of you like sharing your stuff? Okay, man, we got a lot of people that don't like to share. <laughs> all right? The, the early church, they were unselfish with their resources. We talk about time, talent, and treasure. They were generous with their time. They were generous with their gifts. They were generous with their financial, you know, their treasures. Listen to this. And all the believers met together in one place, let's read it, and shared. Yeah. Now that's, that's weird. That creates a tension for us. Because I don't want you to borrow my mower. Right? That's how we feel. I don't want you to take this. But the reality is, unrelated to mowers, <laughs> the reality is, is that God calls us to be generous with what we have. So here's my question, instead of getting the mind off the mower. What is it God has gifted you with? Maybe you're good at leadership. Are you sharing that with people? Maybe you're good at singing. You have the gift of singing. Does anybody know you can do it? Maybe you're talented at construction. Are you doing it for God's glory or just your own home? Every single one of us has something that God has given us that we are not to called to hoard and just make money and do things with our own power with. We're called to share it so that people can come to know Christ. Imagine if that was our filter, that the gifts and abilities that you have are to reach others for Jesus Christ. They sold their property. Remember earlier I talked about they were able to speak in different languages? This is a, basically just a different example, but the same spirit. They sold their property and possessions. Who thinks about selling their house so people can come to know Jesus? Not, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to sell your house. But think about this. They were so convinced. Some of you are business people, and you're, you're willing to bet the farm on some idea that you have. They were willing to say, I'm going to sell my, my property and my possessions and my money. I mean, you want to talk about when you preach a message on tithing, there's no more tense atmosphere than when you preach on tithing. Why? Because when you start messing with money, people start to get, whoa, hey, what are you doing here? Right? They shared their money with those in need. Instead of saying, well, they don't, da 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 so I'm not going to. And at the same time, they worship together at the temple. How often? Each day. Man, we set aside three weeks each year, or each year for Pray 21. I realize that my wife, she can't be here on, on, in the mornings because she's getting the kids around for school. But you can turn your phone on and watch in the morning. And if you can't do it then, it's on a recording. You can watch it whenever. And honestly, it's, obviously, it's not a once-a-year thing. Really, the goal of Pray 21 is to make it an emphasis, but it really needs to be a part of our day every day. Amen? So how do we grow God's church? And why, do we, why does this matter? Because there's people around you that you know that need Jesus. And when you're not letting God finish what he started in you, they're sitting over there waiting on you to let God finish what he started in you. Did you know, college students, high school students, there's people at your school that won't know Jesus unless you tell them. How are they going to know? There's people that you, that you work with, adults, that God might want you to talk to them about Jesus and not just talk to them about, well, I got that over with. Who don't have to do that again for another 30 years. But to understand it, that you're like, hey, I'm going to like get in their life and build relationship with them. And did you know it's not the pastor's job to do all of that? In fact, do you know what scripture says my job is? To equip the saints to do that job. <laughs> 
Churches that are built around the pastor doing everything, they're limited. Because take me out of it, any pastor, research says one, one person can only effectively reach 70 to 100 people. It takes all of us, amen? It takes every one of us having a burden saying, well, Monday stinks, can't wait till Friday, instead of saying, Lord, who do you have in my life today that I could be salt and light to? TGIF, I don't think TGIF is biblical because the Bible says this is the day. This is, oh, I won't sing it, I won't, you know. <laughs> they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why? Because the apostles hadn't written, written the, the Bible yet, right? But, so we know it today as biblical teaching, okay? They devoted themselves to biblical teaching. What does that mean? You think of devoted, all right? Let me tell you, my wife has lots of strength. My wife is devoted to our family, I mean, she is devoted. She is about making sure. Can you imagine if we were that devoted to God's word? Devoted. We've had a couple in our church that were married like 60-some years, maybe even longer than that. They were devoted to each other. Marriage is about devotion. Can you imagine being that devoted to God's word, even above your marriage, above everything, to be devoted to God and, and, and like, God, what does your word say? Now, this one seems like kind of not as important in our culture today. And it's suffering right now. I'm just going to be honest with COVID. But the reality is, we were created to be together. They devoted themselves to fellowship with who? With who? With other believers. Why? Because ideally, right, in some churches it's unhealthy and there's backbiting and talking. I'm not talking about that. But in a healthy situation where, where people understand the purpose, that it's not about being uniform but about unity, they understand that there is something that happens when we sharpen each other. Because believe it or not, sometimes I come to church and I'm down. And sometimes you come to church and you're down and you see someone and you're like, oh man, this happened this week. And you're like, can I pray with you? There's something that happens. You know why that, that this was listed as one of the things in scripture and acts is because we're better together. And that's not just a slogan you say at some leadership conference where you're trying to market something. It's the truth. We're better together. Amen. In fact, when you see scripture where Jesus sends out people, he sent them out in twos. When we planted that church in Columbus, we, we sent out two, Sean and Matt at that time. We didn't just send Sean. Why? Because we need each other. They devoted themselves to sharing meals together. Well, that seems kind of weird that that would be that big of a deal. Man, I look back. I've been to this church since I was 10 years old. I left for about 10 years and came back. The amount of lunch lunches I've had at the mall deli with Pastor Jim who happens to be in this service and many of you here and many in the other service that have sharpened me and helped me and politely told me you know this isn't what you should do you should do this you know there's something about coming together Pastor Adam is always trying to get people in small groups why to annoy you no because groups is where you grow. Instead of sitting here listening to me, you sit and you talk in a group of people who have similar experiences in life and you sharpen each other. Some groups turn into gossip sessions. That's not what that's about, right? It, it's about sharpening each other. They devoted themselves to, to f- meals together and the Lord's Supper. Why did they in- devote themselves to the Lord's Supper? To remember some of you have lost someone special to you, and every year on that anniversary, and some of it's fresh, some of you it's fresh, you pull out their pictures. Why? To remember. It's important to you. Why do we take communion as a church? To remember what Christ has done for us. To remember. Why do we need to remember? Because we forget. I mean, we don't completely forget. I don't forget that Jesus died for me, but it's not always at the top of my brain all the time the way it should be. When we read his word, when we take communion, when we come together, it helps us remember. And then, of course, an obvious one. They devoted themselves to prayer with God, the culture, the atmosphere. You think when Peter got up and and preached, no one had been praying? 
You think when, when Stephen was martyred and all these different people, if you study scripture, who went th- through things, do you think when the walls came down, do you think when, when the chains fell off and Peter walked out of the prison that somebody wasn't praying? Can I tell you, prayer changes things. Now, we erased their names, but there was, there was names on these boards this last year that had a line through them. Why? Because they came to know Christ. And you know what, Adam, I thought of this earlier today. We all start with our name on the prodigal board. I was born, we are born with our name on that board. And when you let God finish what he started in you, you become active. You want to talk about growing your faith? It's not another small group class. It's not reading more. It's getting involved in, in, in trying to get someone's name erased through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you have that atmosphere going on, it's easy to praise God and enjoy the goodwill of all the people. Bars are filled today because they just want to feel community. And the whole time the church is like, huh, it's not alcohol that can change people's lives in a, in a gathering. It's the Holy Spirit. And there's no greater place to experience God's presence than among the church. So how do we grow the church? This is what it said. If you're just reading scripture and you were studying the tendencies of what made the early church grow, let's read those, that list. Biblical teaching, fellowship with believers, sharing, and And this is the byproduct of those things. Let's read it. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those. There you go. This morning, um, as our band comes up to to play, and we kind of switch gears going into communion today, I wonder if we could just be reminded again this morning that what Jesus has saved us from. Now, some of you have got some really crazy stories of your life was lost and God came and he just did this amazing work in your life and and you were delivered from drugs. We used to have a youth pastor here named Dylan, and he had this crazy story of, you know, his dad was in jail and his mom was a crack addict, and he came to know Christ, and he was a bully at school. And the reality is we don't always have that story. I'll just I tell you my quick story. I grew up in church, was in church every Sunday, but I was as lost as it got. So no matter whether you got some really cool story of how God delivered you or you just have a story of just being unfaithful, And realizing that you need to be faithful, the reality is no matter what your story is, we all come under the umbrella of we can receive grace because Jesus died for us. 